Hello, and welcome to A New Way Forward, Reimagining the Nonprofit Workplace Virtual Engagement Series, presented by Council of Michigan Foundations, Michigan Nonprofit Association, Michigan Community Resources, and COAC Detroit. This engaging and interactive multi-part series is designed to provide guidance to nonprofits throughout Michigan as you consider re-entry into the workplace. Sessions are grounded in equity and designed to balance the exploration of legal, HR, and financial requirements, as well as ways to strengthen team culture, redefine the workspace, and align to mission. Today's session is HR Policies, Procedures, and Practices for Workplace Workspace Reentry. I am Kelly Kuhn, Vice President of Michigan Nonprofit Association, and I will serve as your host. Before we begin, we want to express our appreciation to anyone returning from our most recent sessions, as well as extend a warm welcome to those joining us for the first time. We have another great session planned today and are excited to hear from our presenters who will share policies, procedures, and practices they've developed while remaining committed to stay, staff safety. We'll discuss lessons and learn from organizations that have moved to working remotely, as well as those that continued working in their physical setting and adapt, adapted to align with evolving recommendations and requirements from the state of Michigan. A few housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be shared afterward. We have built in time for questions and answers. All participants are muted, so please use the chat function to ask your questions. As you know, the information around COVID-19 is moving at a rapid pace and the situation is ever changing. We are all doing our best to understand and apply what we can. This context is important to express as we begin today, as our presenters plan to share guidance, which should not be construed as legal or financial advice. Today's session is number three in our series and will focus on HR policies, procedures, and practices for workspace reentry. Our past sessions began with a robust conversation around reimagining the nonprofit workplace with special guest, Governor Whitmer, followed by a session on legal guidance for safely returning to the workplace and another session that talked about creative design solutions for reentry. The slides and webinar recordings for all the sessions are available on each of our presenting organizations' websites. Now to introduce our moderator, Alexis Davis. Alexis Davis serves as a client management associate and paralegal for Michigan Community Resources. Her role entails engaging with community partners to best connect them to pro bono services and legal advice. Alexis is a Cincinnati native whose passion for youth and service brought her to Detroit. After her fellowship year with Challenge Detroit, she was eager to continue working in the public sector. Alexis is a current Master of Community Development student at Detroit Mercy, where she hopes to expand her knowledge of organizational and nonprofit governance. Alexis is also a proud alumni of North Carolina A&T State University, where she earned degrees in both psychology and political science. She is fiercely committed to creating more equitable outcomes for marginalized communities through advocacy, policy, and legal reform. Welcome, Alexis. Thank you, Kelly, so much. Um, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, as stated, my name is Alexis, and I will serve as the moderator. So we have some great speakers that are here with us um, this morning to talk to us about HR policies and equity in the workplace. So let's get started. Um, I would first like to introduce our first speaker, Anne Marie Welch. Anne Marie Welch is a member in Clark Hill's Labor and Employment Practice Group. As an employment and labor law specialist, Anne Marie defends employers in state and federal lawsuits and administrative proceedings. Additionally, to prevent lawsuits and promote positive workplaces, Anne Marie routinely counsels management regarding labor and employment best practices. Anne Marie has significant experience in servicing healthcare, education, nonprofit, manufacturing, and construction industries. She earned her JD magna cum laude from Michigan State University College of Law. She is also a member of the American Employment Law Council. Anne Marie currently serves as a board member for the American Society of Employers and as a council member for the State Bar of Michigan Labor and Employment Law section. She is also active in the ABA Equal Employment Opportunity Law section. Anne Marie has pivoted in this public health crisis to help counsel in relation to employment issues related to COVID-19. She and the firm Clark Hill have a strong commitment to pro bono service and making a difference in the greater community. Let us welcome Anne Marie. Hi, thank you so much for that nice introduction and I'm really happy to be with you all. 
Um, again, my name is Anne Marie Welch. I'm an attorney at Clark Hill. I've been working with nonprofits now for about 15 years. Um, I had a chance to take a peek at the registration list and saw some familiar faces. So hi for those of you out there that I know. Uh, and for those of you uh, out there who I don't know, um, thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate um, you joining us. Um, uh, Clark Hill has offices in Lansing, Grand Rapids, Birmingham, uh, and, and Detroit in Michigan. Um, and so today I'm here to talk about some of the essential considerations for returning to work. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk to you for about 40 minutes, but you know, this could clearly be an all day session. There are so many things for you to consider when bringing your staff back to the workplace and, and, and doing so in a safe manner. And I'm sure that some of you may be overwhelmed in thinking about it. And so um, I hope to give you some, some guidance that, that will help you create lists and things of that nature that'll get you started here if you haven't done so already. So first, this is kind of a roadmap, wrap, roadmap of what we're gonna talk about today. First, we're gonna talk about, you know, what are the, what are the things to consider? Um, what are the things to look at when you're preparing the workplace for safe re-entry? There is so much guidance out there and so, much, so many different executive orders. I think we're on, uh, we're in the 150s now, I think, and you know, perhaps even more could be coming out as, as I conduct this webinar today. Um, uh, and then once we talk about you know, how you prepare your workplace for safe re-entry, we're going to talk about how to deal with actually bringing the workers back and workers who are afraid to come back to work, who don't want to come back to work, who want some sort of accommodation or need some sort of leave. Um, we're going to touch on um, workplace exposures or workers who get sick or what happens if somebody gets sick in the workplace. Um, and lastly, I always like to give some takeaways or action steps, so I'll leave you with some of those. Again, if you have questions throughout, feel free to use the chat function um, and, uh, and we'll get to those during the question and answer or through the chat function itself. Okay, so on the next slide, what I'm going to share with you are some statistics from a survey conducted by software company uh, Qualtrics at the end of April. And they surveyed more than 2,000 people in the U.S. on how confident they felt about returning to their workplace or visiting public establishments and what it would take for them to feel comfortable doing so. So next slide, please. Oh, you're already there. Okay, so from baby boomers to Generation Z, more than 65% of respondents in each age group reported being wary about returning. Overall, the respondents uh, were almost evenly split on whether things are gonna get back to normal with 52% 52, 52 answering yes and 48% answering no. Around one in four of respondents expected to return to work in May, 28% expected to return to work in June, and 31% expected to return to work in August or later. And I'm seeing just varying um, uh, metrics around uh, the state of Michigan in, in terms of, and around the country, in terms of you know, when workers are gonna be brought back to work. Um, for example, at Clark Hill, I'm still working from home. Um, and I'm probably going to be working from home until September, but some of our other attorneys have already gone back to work and some workplaces are doing phased approach and some um, are all being brought back to work. It really depends on what type of workforce you're in. And, and right now, when you look at Governor Whitmer's executive order, if an employee is able to work from home, they're still supposed to be doing so. Um, uh, so I think there's just, uh, a variation on where people are in this. And there are a lot of concerns that employees have about going back to work, as you can see on this slide. But let's turn to the next slide. Okay, so when you are preparing the workplace for safe re-entry, there are so many considerations, like I said, and so many things you need to look to. First of all, what does your state or local law require? Um, again, right now for, um, for workplaces in Michigan that are looking to reopen, you wanna to look to executive order number 145. Um, and if you're looking at this webinar presentation a week from now, it could be a different one, um, but currently it's executive order 145, which rescinded executive order 114, 
um, and it lays out the guidelines for what you need to return your workers uh, safely. With respect to offices, um, uh, one new thing perhaps is that you need to make sure that your uh, employees are wearing face baths or face coverings um, in common areas like hallways and bathrooms and in in-person meetings. Um, but again, you got to have to. You really need to keep up with looking at those executive orders. And if you don't do that yourself, you can look to, you know, Clark Hill's websites or when, any one of the organizers' websites. I'm sure that they're continuing to put out information out there. Um, you can link link in with me as well if you want, and I continually try to update this stuff on social media to keep all of my contacts informed. Um, you want to look at your local law. There are different county ordinances um, that come into play. You want to look at what does OSHA recommend and OSHA has kind of taken a hot seat on this one because people have been criticizing OSHA for not actually putting out specific COVID-19 guidance because uh, excuse me rules because OSHA has said well we you know we have all these other rules and we think that they do apply but OSHA has put out um, some guidance for workplaces to follow and a roadmap for creating a COVID-19 preparedness plan and in fact, uh, Governor Whitmer's executive order requires workplaces to have preparedness plans that follow OSHA's preparedness plan, uh, plans. Uh, you have to have one and you have to make it available to your employees and to visitors that come to your workplace. So if you don't already have one, um, you wanna make sure that you do it. It has to be available within, within two weeks of you reopening. Um, what does the CDC recommend? And um, again, this is an area where you really need to keep up to date on the CDC's website because they've been changing um, their guidance as we're learning more and more about COVID-19. What does the EEOC allow, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission? Um, you know, there's been a lot of concern about um, discrimination against uh, different national origins um, and also those with um, disabilities and accommodations and the, e the EEOC has been putting out a ton of guidance on how to handle uh, COVID-19 um, with respect to accommodations and uh, medical inquiries and things of that nature. And we're going to talk about some of that today. Um, what do your customers require or your, your grantees or your grantors when you're going to their workplaces? Um, you need to prepare your staff if they're going to be interacting um, with other uh, organizations, uh, what their requirements are, you know, what are their testing requirements for going on site if you're able to go on site or it's necessary to go on site. You need to prepare your workforce for that. What does your insurance require? You know, your workers comp carrier and your general liability carriers may have some requirements for um, cleanliness or screening or things of that nature to maintain your insurance. And I would have a quick call with your um, insurance agent to find out if there's anything specific there. And then are there any industry needs or, or guidelines out there? I'm sure um, various nonprofit agencies have put out um, uh, guidance and I'm sure you're all talking with each other through these webinars and other things about um, what you're doing because this is new for all of us, right? And we're all in this together and we can all learn from, from each other about what's working and what's not working. And keeping in touch with your contacts right now is critical um, to, to learn about uh, how to improve your own practices based on learning from others. So next slide, please. Okay, so like I said, OSHA has been a little bit in the hot seat for not putting out um, specific rules with respect to COVID-19, um, but they have uh, put out a recommended um, uh, pandemic policy uh, components for you, some guidance out there. Um, and, and they've given you kind of a blueprint to what, what to put in it. And this is again, what is required by executive order number 145, is that you have a plan um, that aligns with OSHA's uh, preparedness plan, okay? And the first thing you need to do is make sure that you uh, educate your workers on basic and infection prevention measures. So making sure that you're putting up all that great signage from the CDC in your workplace about sneezing into your elbow and washing your hands and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, how to do prompt identification and isolation of, of sick individuals. 
um, meaning making sure that you're doing appropriate screening and putting in your plan what the screening measures are. And, you know, if someone's sick, what are you going to do? Well, you know, in accordance with executive order number 36 um, in the state of Michigan, if, if uh, an individual comes in close contact with someone who's symptomatic, uh, of COVID-19 or who um, is diagnosed with COVID-19, they're supposed to self-quarantine for 14 days. And so you need to make sure that you're um, incorporating those rules into your preparedness plan, making sure you have a communication plan with your employees um, about all of your uh, infection uh, prevention measures and things of that nature. And again, it's required in Michigan that you publish the plan to your employees. Um, talks about workplace controls, putting into effect um, environmental controls. And, and what they say there is you really need to go into your space and walk it. See where can people not be six feet apart? You know, the open work, workspace concept was terrific when it first came out, but in the age of COVID, it's going to be really difficult to go back to an open workspace if the workspaces aren't six feet apart. And so I've got employers that are installing plexiglass and, and um, moving desks and things of that nature. So that way people can be six feet apart. And I've got other employers that are so worried about um, the second wave uh, and potentially being back in shelter in place that what they're doing is they're evaluating the cost of actually taking some of these uh, workplace controls and the cost uh, in loss of productivity of having folks work from home and just deciding, you know what, instead of reopening the workplace, maybe I am going to let people work remotely for a little bit longer. And that's something that you need to think about as well, making sure that you have proper ventilation. You know, and we're reading right now from who in the CDC that perhaps air conditioning is um, causing uh, the spread of COVID-19. So again, we're all learning about what is the proper ventilation right now. But uh, to, now is the time to look at your HVAC system and, and making sure that um, it's as good as it can be and that you have proper filters in and things of that nature. Okay, what, if, what, do you have, what if you have an elevator? You know, are you gonna make one-way hallways? Again, you really just need to walk your space and think about how are we going to have employees in here safely because remember we're going to go back to the workplace and we're going to default to normal but it's not normal anymore um, we can't go and get a cup of coffee like we used to we can only go in there if there's you know adequate space for us to do so um, do we need to close the cafeteria altogether it really depends on your workspace um, but these are decisions that you need to think about uh, before reopening and again, making sure that you follow OSHA standards um, with respect to, you know, your normal uh, protocol. What OSHA has said and things of that nature is that um, they're going to be relaxed right now because they realize that you may not be able to report as you used to or take all the um, uh, follow all the all the rules um, in 100 percent compliance as before because uh, we're not necessarily at work. Um, so they're going to be a little bit relaxed on um, enforcing everything, but you still have to make a by with OSHA. Okay, next slide, please. The biggest thing that OSHA has said and that makes total sense here is that you, this is the time as employers that we need to over communicate to our employees about what we're doing to keep them safe. Okay, and OSHA has said that the, you know, perhaps the number one way to prevent absenteeism in the workplace due to fear or sickness is to make sure that you're communicating with your employees about what you're doing to keep them safe. Okay, so you really need to do that and think about your plan um, and, and implement it in a smart way and tell your employees about what you're doing to keep them safe. Next slide, please. So one of the biggest questions that I'm getting from employers is about testing. When can we test? Can we test? What can we test? Okay, and the EEOC has given some great guidance on this. 
And what the EEOC has said is that, you know, because this is a um, pandemic that threatens the safety of individuals at the workplace, so it's a direct threat to the safety of your employees, is that you can test for COVID-19, uh, but it must be an accurate test. Um, and so what I would recommend as an employer is that you probably don't want to do the testing yourself, but send your employees to a testing clinic. Um, it, it may not be feasible for you to do COVID-19 tests on every employee um, before they return to work, but you're certainly able to do so. Um, you can't just pick and choose certain employees uh, necessarily. You have to make a neutral uh, application of the rule um, unless somebody is symptomatic or perhaps they've done something that um, would render them more susceptible to COVID-19. So for example, if you know that they've traveled out of state right now, I've got a lot of employers who have implemented rules that unless you get a COVID-19 test, um, uh, you can't come back to work in the workplace. Um, so a lot of different considerations there though, You know, are you gonna pay for the employee to wait to get the test results? There's so many things to consider here. Um, and if you don't pay for the employee to wait for the test results, are they gonna volunteer information to you like how, whether or not they've traveled out of state? What about screening? If you're not gonna do COVID-19 testing because it's not practicable for your workplace, um, can you do screening? Yes, you can. And yes, you, you should be doing screening um, uh, in accordance with the governor's executive orders. You can take temperatures if you want to, or you can have employees self-report their temperatures before they come to work. If you do take temperatures, make sure that individuals have proper PPE, um, uh, are wearing face masks and gloves and things of that nature, or using touchless thermometers, and that you have appropriate privacy measures in place uh, for the employees that are getting their temperatures taken. Um, you can ask about the symptoms. Make sure that you're asking about the current symptoms related to COVID-19. And again, I would check the CDC website to make sure you're up to date on that. Okay. And again, just make sure that you're not putting these testing results in with the employee's personnel files. They, they are a confidential record and you need to keep them confidential. So next slide, please. What about a fitness for duty? Yes. You can require employees to get fitness for duties before they return back to work. Um, but you've got to realize that it's really hard to get a doctor's appointment right now, especially if you're not already sick. Um, and doctor's appointments aren't going to be necessarily traditional. Um, oftentimes, uh, they'll be telehealth. And so um, the guidance from the CDC is that employers should be flexible in um, the form of documentations that they take um, for fitness for duties. It might just be an email from a doctor, which you're not used to seeing. Okay, so it may not be necessarily practicable to get fitness for duty tests from all your employees, but certainly if they've been out sick, you may wanna get one. Next slide, please. Another question I get a lot is, can we require our employees to wear protective gear? Yes, you can require it. Um, and it's also required under Michigan's executive order number 145 for certain employees, especially if they can't maintain um, uh, social distancing um, six feet apart. They should be wearing masks three feet apart. They should be wearing face shields potentially. Um, or at least you should, the executive order said you, you should consider having them wear face shields um, uh, and you should be supplying uh, face coverings to your employees upon their entry to the workplace. But let's talk a little bit more about masks. Next slide, please. Okay, so face coverings, what do they do? Okay, first of all, um, most of our nonprofit employers here aren't medical uh, healthcare providers. So we're not talking about N95 masks, we're just talking about cloth or paper masks. Okay, and these face coverings are meant to prevent the wearer from spreading the virus. Okay, um, they are not considered PPE, so we don't have to follow normal OSHA rules with respect to PPE. Okay. Um, uh, 
if you are do if you are providing uh, reusable face coverings, so um, uh, cloth masks, um, we need to make sure that employees know that they need to be routinely washed, which means at when they return home each day, they should be washed before they come back to work. Um, and if you're if you're providing paper masks or allowing employees to wear paper masks, then they need to be routinely changed. They can't just wear the same mask back and forth every day because that's not working in the way that it should be. Again, I would post the CDC guidance on wearing face coverings in the workplace. Next slide, please. Okay, but with respect to masks and, and face coverings, and if you're a place of public accommodation, obviously most of you guys know that at this point, um, uh, you have to uh, require individuals come in um, to wear face masks as well. Um, but with respect to face masks, um, some people have uh, disabilities that would prevent them from wearing a, a face mask, or some people have uh, sincerely held religious beliefs that would conflict with their ability to wear a face mask. And um, what the EEOC has said is that you need to accommodate or attempt to accommodate um, those individuals who can't wear a face mask. The EEOC has said that, you know, I understand that employers are going through economic hardships right now. And so the threshold to get to the undue burden or the undue hardship where you don't have to accommodate individuals is perhaps lowered um, because there are so many um, economic hardships out there. But you know, if an employee can't wear a face mask, but they can wear a face shield, that's not very expensive. And employers are still gonna have to do that, okay? And so if an employee comes in and says, I can't wear a face mask, then you need to have a discussion with them. I would request medical uh, documentation from the doctor uh, and a proposed alternative accommodation from the doctor and engage in the interactive process just like you normally would with that employee. So next slide, please. A huge question that I've been getting from employers is, what if my employees don't want to return to work? How do I handle that? Okay, and that's a big problem because a lot of employees are scared. They've got, you know, kids at home and no daycare. They've got elderly parents that they're that they're caring for. Um, they've got um, disabilities themselves that make them more scared. There are so many different reasons. And if we turn to the next slide, I listed it out there about why employees may not want to come back to work. If you furloughed your staff, sometimes they're making more money on unemployment than they would be normally, especially with the federal subsidy. So they may be financially motivated not want to not want to return to work. Um, so let's talk about some of these issues in a little bit more detail. Next slide. Um, first is, I'm afraid to come into work. Well, okay, but plain fear isn't enough to prevent an employee um, or, or, allow them, or allow them to stay home, okay? But this is an opportunity to have a conversation with your employee and ask them, well, why are you afraid? and remind them of all the wonderful things that you've done to keep them safe um, when they're in the workplace and all the things that you've done to prepare for their, for their return to work. And you wanna find out is the underlying reason um, about why they're afraid to come into work, is it, um, is it a protected reason? Um, could they get leave under the Families First Coronavirus Act? And we're gonna talk about that um, coming up. Uh, you know, do they have a disability and they need an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act? We're going to talk about that. You know, do they have a family member um, uh, that, that lives with them that's immunocompromised and their doctor is going to recommend that they self-quarantine or that they continue to self-quarantine? Well, that could be a protected reason under the FSCRA. Um, what if they have a pre-existing condition, for example, anxiety, um, where they're requesting an accommodation to stay at home so that their anxiety doesn't get heightened? Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that as we think about returning to the workplace. Again, it's, a, it's an opportunity to have a conversation with 
um, with your employees to figure out if they have a protected reason for not wanting to come to work. And if they do, you know, you want to, again, engage in the interactive process to see um, if, uh, if you can accommodate them. Um, and if they are just plain scared to work and you've offered them a position, you want to document that as well. So that way you can you know, supply it to the unemployment insurance agency and keep it on hand uh, if you end up terminating them um, for refusal to come to work in case there's some sort of litigation later. Next slide, please. Well, what if they're afraid to take, or excuse me, what if they're asking to take a leave or if they want to continue, they want to stay out of the office and not working? Well, you, you handle it with every other sort of leave request you get. First, you know, you look at, well, what's the reason? Next, does the law require that they get leave? Um, you know, under the FSBRA, they can get maybe up to 80 hours or 10 weeks if it's for childcare. The Michigan Paid Sick Leave Act could come into play. Um, under the ADA, they could get leave up to six months unpaid, uh, potentially. Under the FMLA, 12 weeks unpaid. Um, what do your policies say? Do your policies allow for a leave of absence? Um, perhaps there's an opportunity to allow them to take leave. Um, what's not listed on here, Executive Order 36, um, I mentioned it earlier, if an individual comes in, into close contact with someone with um, uh, COVID-19, then they need to self-quarantine for 14 days and an employer can't retaliate against that individual and should instead give them unpaid leave in accordance with the executive order. There are so many legal uh, hotbeds here um, that you need to make sure that you're um, thinking through these things carefully. And um, I understand that there's uh, a legal hotline available for you through the community uh, uh, resources. And I'm sure um, we can talk about that in the chat function as well and give you information and access to that as well. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that we were gonna talk about the, the FFCRA. So I wanna make sure we do that. Um, I've done entire webinars on the FFCRA. Um, so I just want to touch on it briefly to so make sure you, you understand who it, who it applies to and what type of leave they can get, okay? So the FFCRA has two different components. The first is emergency paid sick leave, and the second is what I call FMLA plus. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so under the emergency paid sick leave, employees can get 80 hours, up to 80 hours of paid leave at their regular rate because of um, uh, a quarantine pursuant to federal, state, or local government order or the advice of their healthcare provider. Um, the employee is, is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis, or they can get 80 hours of paid sick leave at two thirds their regular rate because they need to care for someone um, who's subject to quarantine or to care for a child whose child care provider is unavailable for reasons uh, related to COVID-19, including right now we're in the summer months, um, there's no summer day camps. Uh, or the employee is experiencing a substantially similar condition as specified by HHS. What does that mean? If you could tell me, that would be great. Um, but my understanding is this is kind of leaving an area open in case there's something new and HHS can come out and say that employees should take leave uh, for this other reason. So right now that hasn't really come into play yet, but it could in the future. Um, currently FFCRA leave is available until December 31, uh, 2020. I expect it to be extended um, given the trajectory of COVID-19, but we'll see, and we'll be sure to keep you up to date if it is. Um, and then FMLA Plus, you get up to an additional 10 weeks of paid FMLA leave at two thirds the employee's regular rate uh, if childcare is unavailable. So really what could happen, okay, is um, an employee has 12 weeks of FMLA available to them. Okay, FMLA plus available to them, but the first two weeks are unpaid. So the employee could either substitute their regular PTO that you have available to them. Uh, they could take it unpaid those first two weeks, or they could take emergency paid sick leave. If they use their regular PTO, 
or they um, take it unpaid for the first two weeks, then the next 10 weeks are paid, and then they could take emergency paid sick leave at the end of that. So potentially for childcare leave, individuals could end up taking 14 weeks of leave. But again, I could do a whole nother presentation on FFVRA that would take more than an hour. Um, but I just wanted to give you a broad brush of it. There's tons of information on the DOL's webpage about it as well. Okay. On to the next slide. Want to make sure um, that you know who uh, is entitled to FFCRA. It is individuals who work at employers that are smaller than 500. Okay, the thinking is employers that have more than 500 employees probably have already have robust leave policies. But that 500 employee threshold is counted um, on the date the leave is requested. So if you have a ton of employees on furlough, um, uh, when the leave is requested, you might fall into FSCRA, even though normally you wouldn't. Okay, um, for FMLA Plus, you have to have worked for the employer for 30 days. Um, for regular emergency paid sick, sick leave, it's available to you on your first day of employment. Now, if you are smaller than 50 employees, okay, you can get out of the child care leave under both emergency paid sick leave and FMLA plus, if you can document that it would be uh, financially difficult for you as an employer, okay? All right, next slide, please. Real quickly, let's touch on what if you need an accommodation. I need an accommodation. And employees, um, again, because of their anxiety, um, they may request to keep working from home. Okay, um, or they may request, uh, you know, some other sort of accommodation and you treat this like you normally would. Okay, um, you look at whether or not you can accommodate them, you get a doctor's note um, as to what the accommodation should be. If you can't reasonably uh, um, accommodate them based on uh, what they're requesting, you can propose alternative accommodations and, and you document the process. It's, it's really nothing new here. Okay, but just realize that um, COVID-19 um, has uh, created some more, um, more reasons why individuals may request an accommodation because they're immunocompromised, because of mental health issues, there's a whole host of them. And I would expect you to be seeing more accommodation requests as you reopen. So I would make sure that you have an accommodation request form um and and that um anybody who is tasked with dealing with accommodations is appropriately trained up on how to do so next slide please okay one of the major um requests that you're going to be getting for accommodations may be teleworking and one of the major things that you may be thinking about is whether or not you're just going to continue to allow your employees to telework and again, I can do an entire presentation on teleworking. We're just going to touch on a few issues today. Okay, first of all, you want to make sure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, uh, excuse me, real quickly, I want, I want to touch on a statistic here in this slide, and that is, is that um, they did a study here. And most of our employees want to continue to work from home on average 2.5 days a week. And why? The majority of employees say they're actually more productive working from home, okay? But there are a lot of considerations to think about um, when you're deciding whether or not you're going to allow employees to continue to work from home or whether or not you're gonna grant working from home or teleworking as an accommodation. So let's turn to the next slide, please, and we'll talk about them. Okay, so first of all, you need to think about, you know, are your employees being productive? Are they engaged? You know, do they have, uh, you know, caretaker fatigue or, you know, work from home fatigue? Working from home, I feel like individuals feel like they're on, they're on all the time and expected to work all the time. We've seen huge accruals of PTO because individuals are just um, constantly working. Um, are you able to actually meet your social distancing needs in the space that you have? And if not, maybe working from home is the only option that you have. Um, have you been able to keep your, your data secure? Or do you have a problem with that, having everybody um, 
working from home. I remember when when we first uh, were all starting to work from home in March, there was a big concern of whether or not even all of our servers could handle it. Okay, and we were lucky that we had tested it previously, but you know, it was it, data has been a, a, a big component to all of this. Okay, um, you know, are your employees appropriately tracking their hours if they're not exempt employees? Um, I think we're going to see a huge uptick in FLSA actions, um, Fair Labor Standards Act, and Fair Labor Standards Act um, litigation as a result of individuals doing off the clock work from home. And we want to make sure that we're appropriately tracking that time and that your employees are complying. Okay. Um, and you know, real importantly is, are the employees able to perform their essential functions from home? You know, I think what we're going to see from employees is, is is a lot of employees that say, "Hey, you know, I've just been working from home for the last four or five months now. Why, why do I have to come into work? Um, why can't you accommodate me?" And you know, we really need to be able to document that. Well. Yeah, we did it out of necessity, but when you were working from home, you weren't doing A, B, C, D, and E, and those are essential functions, and so therefore it would be improper for us to accommodate you going forward. Um, and if you haven't documented the ways in which your employees haven't been able to complete their essential functions, I would recommend doing so now. Okay, but you really need to think about all these different considerations before you decide whether or not you're going to pull the trigger on um, allowing employees to continue to telework. And if you do, make sure you have a policy, um, especially with respect to data privacy. Um, it's really important that you have a robust teleworking policy. And if you need one, you know, you can re reach out to me or um, uh, any one of the supporting organizations at this webinar. Okay, so I said I would give you some takeaways and action steps. So we're at that part of the presentation. Let's go through them. And I know it's been a whirlwind and probably overwhelming information, but hopefully this will give you a checklist um, going forward. The okay, next slide, please. Okay, first, okay, if you haven't done it, and I'm sure lots of you have been reading everything that you can get your hands on, but review the CDC guidelines for returning to work, review the OSHA guidelines for returning to work and the, the um, template OSHA um, preparedness uh, plans and what you need to have in there. Uh, make sure you look at Executive Order 145 and make sure I would go to your county's um, uh, health uh, website to see if there are any requirements. For example, for a long time, Oakland and Wayne County were requiring employers um, to ask questions about whether or not employees have traveled. Um, given the uptick of coronavirus uh, cases or COVID-19 cases in other states, um, I would imagine that there's going to be some recommendations coming out in the future on travel. Um, recognize the guidance is fluid, and so I would check them quite frequently. Um, make sure you understand any customer or insurer requirements. Um, talk to each other about what you're doing so you can learn from each other. Okay, and then assess the risk of employees contracting COVID-19 in the workplace and make sure you draft policies and procedures to minimize that risk, including, you know, what's your health screening going to look like? Are you going to have an app? Are you going to require employees to email you? Are you going to do health screening at the door? You really have to think about that. Um, what sort of environmental controls are you going to put in to maintain social distancing, to make sure that employees are following proper infection um, uh, prevention hygiene um, to uh, perform, excuse me, to provide the appropriate PPE. Do you have enough to distribute? Um, and, and when I say PPE, you know, I mean in the OSHA sense, if you're required to have people wear PPE and also in the practical invention, excuse me, infection uh, prevention sense in terms of uh, face masks um, for office employees, you're required to provide them um, According to Executive Order 145, with materials to wipe down their workspaces twice a day. You know, do you have enough of that? Okay. What are you going to do with, res with respect to travel? Are you going to allow your employees to travel? Um, right now, all non-essential travel is going to be canceled. But if you do have to travel, as uh, how are you going to handle that? Um, you know, where are you going to isolate employees if they are 
if they are uh, symptomatic until you can, you know, until they leave. Um, how are you, do you have an appropriate vendor lined up to sanitize your workplace if you have uh, a diagnosis or a symptomatic employee in the workplace? You wanna make sure you have that lined up before you reopen. Okay, how are you gonna communicate to employees about um, what you've done? And there's also required training under executive order number 145. Um, how are you gonna complete that training? Um, um, do you have an accommodation request form? If not, make sure you get one, okay? Revisit your attendance and call-in procedures prior to uh, redistributing them to employees. And you wanna make sure that they don't, they wouldn't prevent an employee or discourage an employee from calling in if they've got, uh, if they're symptomatic. Okay, we don't want symptomatic employees coming into the workplace because that could shut it down. Next slide, please. Okay, again, um, if you don't have a telework policy, create it. If you do have a telework policy, update it. Okay, you want to train your managers and your supervisors. Okay, be especially um, training them on EEO uh policies right now and make sure that they are looking for any type of discrimination or retaliation um, against individuals with disabilities and uh, national origin discrimination i think we need to make sure our managers are vigilant vigilantly uh, monitoring the workplace and preventing it they see it okay um, make sure that, again, you're over communicating to your employees, your customers, your vendors, your suppliers, your third parties. And with respect to their health screening, you can screen any individual who comes into the workplace, not just your employee. Okay. Uh, make sure you hang the FFCRA poster up in the workplace. Okay. And if you've got employees working remotely, make sure you've emailed it to them. Okay. Uh, again, just make sure you're up to date on the guidance and checking it. And just you know, some basics here. Don't forget your fundamentals, consistency, documentation, looking for objective evidence, following traditional legal requirements when making decisions, employment decisions in the workplace. But also realize that this is something new that we're all going through. You know, exercise flexibility and use common sense. If you have questions, you know that you can reach out to me um, this is uh, my telephone number and my email address. Again, you can look at the, um, you can call the legal services uh, hotline that I mentioned, and I'm sure that information will come to you through the chat. And I really thank you for the opportunity to present. Hopefully I've given you some things to think about. Um, and I look forward to uh, the question and answer uh, section at the end. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was a lot of really helpful information. Um, we will transition into our next speaker. So uh, next I'd like to introduce Lara Das. Lara is a human resources manager at WK Kellogg Foundation in Battle Creek, Michigan. In this role, Lara designs and delivers innovative and employee-centric talent solutions to attract and coach top talent that is engaged and ready to deliver on the foundation's strategic plan and organizational ends. Lara is deeply engaged in the foundation's diversity and inclusion priorities and serves in the Asian and Pacific Islander Affinity Group as a way to advance the foundation's commitment to racial healing and equity. She holds a Master of Business Administration MBA with an emphasis in human resources from Xavier Institute of Management in India and a bachelor's degree in economics from Utkal University, India. She is a member of the Kalamazoo Human Resources Management Association, the Society for Human Resource Management, and the World at Work Society of Certified Professionals. Lara brings over 25 years of experience in human resources through diverse industries such as technology, pharmaceuticals, insurance, and nonprofit foundations. Please welcome Lara. Thank you so much, Alexis, for that introduction. And thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, wow, we've heard a lot from Anne-Marie already. And so um, there's a reason why we lean on advisors like her to help us through troubling times that we are in today. So I won't um, spend a lot of time on the specific uh, 
uh, uh, legislative updates and enhancements that we have made personally for the Kellogg Foundation. What I'll try to focus on today more so is just our roadmap in terms of how we went through a process of organizational um, strategy making and planning, one in response to the pandemic itself, which we hope is short term, but more importantly, just looking out into the future and saying um, and asking ourselves, what have we learned from this pandemic? What are our lessons learned and how can we prepare for what we think the future is going to look like? So I'll talk more about our roadmap in terms of um, looking at the Kellogg Foundation, looking at some of our core values and principles and, um, uh, and applying that to any kind of organizational strategy, planning, or just plain reimagining our workplace and our workforce for the future. So with that, go to the next slide. So many of you might know about the W.K. Kellogg Foundation already. We are a private independent philanthropic organization. We were founded in 1930. Uh, we are celebrating our 90th anniversary this year, which is um, huge for us in terms of uh, uh, the legacy that Mr. Will Keith Kellogg brought to us. He was um, a great serial innovator and an entrepreneur, but more so um, he uh, founded the Kellogg Foundation foundation 90 years ago with a very clear directive, which was use the money as you please, so long as it promotes the health happiness and well-being of children. And we have held firm on that commitment, wanting to make sure that our focus has been and will be on children. But there is so much that goes into just that statement and so many different ways in which we um, apply that philosophy to the work that we do. Um, and those are true especially now when we live in such unprecedented times. We uh, started the year with the health pandemic, worrying about the financial and economic fallouts of the virus, still worrying about that. Probably many of us watching the stock market to see where it goes the next day. Um, more recently, watching the very important Black Lives Matter movement unfold, asking ourselves as an organization, perhaps even as individuals, as to how we are going to uphold racial equity and social justice looking ahead to a year of presidential elections, and frankly, thinking past the pandemic and saying, what does the future hold for us? So when we think about Mr. Kellogg's legacy and the significance of it for the Kellogg Foundation, it really spans across a lot of different areas. And we hold firm to that in all the work that we do. The next slide, please. I'm just wanting to dig one layer deeper into how we have that philosophy show up in our WKKF priorities. So when we say we are committed to um, the health and happiness and well-being of children, we know that our children live in families and families live in communities. So for our children to thrive, their families need to be able to provide for themselves and the communities that those families live in need to be equitable places of opportunity. And therein lies more of the work of the foundation. So how do we do that? We do it with some core values around leadership development, community engagement, and racial equity. So when we talk about our values externally and the way we do our work in the community, we want to walk that talk internally as well during the pandemic and thereafter. So we've really wanted our pandemic response and our strategic planning ideas to come from within, from people that represent different communities, from people that are experts in public policy and legislation, um, people that know our grantees and our communities well, people that belong to the same communities and hold values of racial equity close to themselves, and then um, giving us ideas to ensure that our strategies are thoughtful and equitable. 
Um, so I just talked a lot about who we are as the Kellogg Foundation, because the way we plan out our strategies and the way we have responded to this um, pandemic and are continuously planning uh, for the year ahead is really connected in many ways to our core values. All of you will probably have the same uh, circumstances in terms of having your own personal and organizational values, your commitments, your culture, your style of working. You will have um, uh, you know, your own priorities in terms of how you source your talent, where you recruit from, and, um, and what culture you hold true within the organization. So I think that you will see that your strategic planning will, uh, will align with that, just like ours has aligned um, with ours. So um, having said that, I'll just add that right now, we are working from home. Uh, we closed in mid-March or so, and we have um, uh, almost 100% been working remotely. We also have essential workers who are in the building, who come and go, and therefore we have also had to think about uh, that group of employees and um, how, our, um, how our workforce uh, strategies affect them. And then thirdly, we're looking ahead at the uh, period when hopefully we will have a vaccine, Hopefully there will be um, more mass production uh, of uh, protective measures for our employees and we will be in a state where we bring them back. So we're thinking of this in three phases and wanting to build our strategies accordingly. Um, so while uh, where we are might be unique to us and all of you might have might be in different phases of uh, uh, returning to work, but hopefully our strategies will uh, ring a bell. Next slide, please. So if you remember the first quarter of the year, things were moving very quickly. Um, the virus was progressing very unexpectedly. Uh, places like Detroit, close to home, were becoming a hot spot. Um, uh, we were definitely feeling like we were getting caught off guard. We still had employees that were going through business travel. We had visits planned to grantee sites. We had convenings coming up. Um, it seemed like one week we were still going ahead and planning for all those events. And the next week we were realizing that maybe traveling, maybe adding on to exposure uh, was not such a great idea. So definitely we had to uh, uh, look back quickly at where we were, uh, get in touch with what was happening in the world around us. And we uh, pulled together a small uh, COVID-19 working group, which was very cross-functional, representative of key areas across the organization. There were operational team members, um, there were key advisors, there were um, grant-making officers and uh, leaders in public policy, like I mentioned. So we had people from the operational and the grant-making site coming together to um, uh, to brainstorm around uh, what we needed to do uh, right then. Uh, and we decided that we would uh, close. So we closed in mid-March and decided um, instead to just focus on continuing the work that we needed to do but virtually. Now, I will add that what helped us with that was that about a year or so ago, we had introduced for our organization a flexible work program where we were beginning to um, allow some of our employees to work offsite. And um, that initiative had really uh, encouraged us to talk about other things, like what technology we have in place, um, uh, what connectivity do our employees have, uh, how will we manage uh, uh, performance standards, how will we manage time. So there was a lot that had gone into introducing a flexible work program. And one year later, when we were hit with the pandemic and we all of a sudden had to move to 100% remote work, that planning really helped us. But in terms of who we are as an organization, we 
uh, while we are very people oriented and very passionate about the work that we do, internally, we are also a very performance driven organization. And we do a lot of communication around what business continuity to us means and what performance means in terms of um, effectiveness at the foundation. So we went back to the basics and reminded ourselves of what it took to perform our work effectively. So this is where we began to emphasize again with our employees some um, key concepts around execution and engagement. So we went back to our organizational ends, looking at outcomes that we wanted to achieve in the community, making sure that that was still core to the work we do at the foundation. Um, uh, but also talking about how that related to team goals and individual goals and how we wanted the work to be performed um, through collaboration, through constant communication, through adaptability, um, through agility. So these are some core um, concepts around the what and the how that we talk about at the foundation. So what being core to our organizational ends, the how being core to how we want to do our work as a team, as a cross-functional team, not just as individual contributors. And more than anything else, we also began to emphasize employee well-being. So providing role clarity on one hand, and then committing to support our employees as needed during the pandemic was key. So we, we focused on effectiveness from a business continuity standpoint, and we also doubled up to come up with our organizational response strategies. Um, so there were some um, core things that we have put into place uh, in terms of employee safety and well-being. We haven't um, uh, emphasized we've we've emphasized this to our employees over and over and over again and yet it's never going to be enough for us employee health and safety is um is of our highest priority and we want our employees to know that so this is something that we wanted to uh, emphasize to them whether it was in the way we closed our offices cancel business travel, put on hold other convenings, et cetera. But we did it through um, many different channels of communication. One of the most appreciated um, uh, uh, principles uh, or techniques uh, by our employees is our town hall meeting, which is led by our president and CEO and other members of the leadership team and um, uh, and other employees as needed. But our town hall meetings um, happen once every two weeks. And this is our way to connect with our employees in a very, very honest and transparent way, whether it is to say we don't know what's happening, we're still trying to figure it out, or whether it is to say we care, we are concerned, we want to hear from you, let's talk about uh, what resources we need to provide um, you for, uh, for your personal needs and you for your um, uh, work-related needs. We've also rolled out a set of snapshot surveys, which come out again every few weeks, and go to all employees seeking regular input and feedback from them about what they are hurting from, what is going well, what isn't going well, what else do they need? Um, and that has been very much appreciated. Of course, Anne-Marie talked about uh, the importance of keeping an eye on the legislations. Yes, we went ahead and made the uh, necessary updates. Um, you know, early in the year, um, the SECURE Act was uh, giving us some things to think about. And then, of course, came the other uh, legislative updates specific to the pandemic. So if you haven't already, then um, uh, please use uh, the guidance that is out there to put in place your appropriate policies for leaves, look at your medical plan coverage levels, look at your retirement plan uh, options um, that are um, uh, meant to provide employees relief with some of the financial hardship that they or their family members might be facing. So definitely pay attention to the legislative updates. Um, in terms of ensuring access to technology, we began to hear from our employees um, uh, just in terms of the fact that 
working from home felt great maybe for the first few days and then the excitement began to wear off as we went into week three week four month two and then we began to hear about don't think uh, i don't think that my workplace is set up just right i don't think i have all my supplies i wish i uh, uh, i'm not paying attention to my posture uh, etc and uh, we went ahead and gave our employees a one-time stipend of $500 to cover for office equipment and supplies. And $500 is not a small amount, uh, but when you think about the possible healthcare claims that you might be avoiding because people are now taking care of themselves and uh, not rushing to chiropractic care, to massage therapy, uh, to physical therapy, etc., the uh, the return on investment can be huge. And in terms of, again, just showing support and care and concern for our employees, that went a long way. Um, and technology also in terms of just reimagining the way we do work in, our, in a virtual environment. So we have learned to uh, really go paperless and begin to look at our uh, procedures and our protocols to say what else can be done electronically and it can be something as simple as changing a form by applying a digital signature or it can be about uh, looking at um, complete paper-based processes that uh, uh, could uh, possibly be enhanced or taken away. So using this as an opportunity to say, how do we reinvent the work that we do in a virtual environment? Wellness I mentioned was huge. So we've introduced this concept of light Fridays uh, where we're um, uh, wanting teams to just stay away from meetings and giving people the time to just uh, rebalance their own work, get caught up or just take more personal time for themselves. So Light Fridays has been very appreciated by our employees. We've introduced these short guided meditation sessions, uh, happens every Friday for us. But if you have an employee assistance uh, program vendor like HelpNet, they have also been uh, doing these for their clients. So look around and ask your partners in terms of what they might already be offering up. And um, again, I mentioned we're very people oriented and very passionate about the work we do. So virtual celebrations for new hires, birthdays, anniversaries, retirements. Um, uh, some of these are very small things to uh, think about and implement, but they go a long way in um, a gathering employee engagement and um, and you'll hear about it you'll hear the appreciation from employees who just feel that they are being supported during a time that has brought with it so much uncertainty and finally i'll just add that um, uh, the way we engage with our employees is through our leaders. Our people leaders, our managerial and supervisory staff actually get to know the pulse of the organization. So encourage, uh, encouraging our leaders to have frequent conversations with employees goes a long way in terms of how we make sure that we provide role clarity, that we ensure that uh, people understand their deliverables. Uh, we've been flexible on work schedules and just understanding personal needs of employees and being able to support them during this time. So I talked about a lot in terms of what went into our response strategy just as the pandemic um, kicked in. And now looking ahead into um, uh, the, uh, the time beyond the pandemic, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, here is a quick glimpse of some of our emergence principles, uh, which has been our uh, guideline for how we build our strategy uh, going forward. So for us, our key message framing for all communication uh, internally and externally was essentially our first principle, which was prioritizing the health and safety of our staff um, and our extended members. 
So this remains as one of our guiding principles. But we also wanted to factor in individual health and family circumstances. And Marie went into specific um, circumstances that your employees might be facing. Of course, um, employees with young children impacted by daycare and school closings, employees with aging parents that are at higher risk, um, employees with personal health conditions that might be looking for additional accommodations. So we wanted to factor factor in those circumstances, take a very gradual and cautious approach, um, not rush our employees back to work at the cost of employee safety, wanting the experts in the organization to guide us through the data and the relevant guidelines out there and reminding ourselves that we had to be fluid and agile. Uh, next slide, please. I also mentioned the snapshot surveys that we have been doing with our employees and, um, uh, and our snapshot surveys are meant to be uh, meant to take less than five minutes uh, answering just about four, five, six questions maximum. Uh, but for us, this has been huge because one, employees really begin to feel that, um, uh, that we come to the table with positive intent and that their voice is being heard. So um, the questions we have been asking go deep into what their concerns are and what would uh, be helpful to them as we look ahead towards um, uh, returning back to the workplace. And some of these um, uh, questions might hold true for you too, but it really gave us clues about if people are concerned about returning to work, if people would prefer to work from home full time, then rather than spending all our time and effort right now on return to work policies, let's instead change gears and move towards leadership development, coaching, uh, providing role clarity, uh, uh, helping them get set up adequately with their office equipment. So it really helped guide how we established our priorities and what we focused on first. Next slide, please. One of our other priorities also in terms of just um, looking ahead at our emergence plan phases is that we have become very clear that we are going to base our return to work, our emergence planning around conditions and not timelines or quotas. So we did not want to establish a guideline that said we will start with you know, 20 percent of our workforce coming back on the 1st of August. We didn't want to make announcements about reopening and then have to pull back again because conditions were changing. And as conditions continue to change, we're seeing that with announcements about schools opening or reopening, you see the stress that gets created based on whether people are convinced about preparedness or not. We didn't want to replicate that within the organization. So we we have been basing our planning on conditions. And in the process, we've again been just um, looking to that cross-functional COVID-19 working group and wanting to make sure that all of those voices are heard in terms of what's important and how should we manage our priorities. Next slide, please. To dig one layer deeper into what we are doing specifically for emergence planning and returning to work. We are looking at this in terms of three different core areas that we need to, that we want to do right. Uh, so, and that, that refers to people, facilities, and long-term business continuity. So in terms of people, some of the things that we are focusing on are core employee engagement strategies. I've talked a lot already about some of the things we have done, but looking ahead, um, for sure, talent sourcing and acquisition strategies for you and your organization, um, just like we are expecting for us, will change forever. Um, once we are past this pandemic, many employers out there will be 
um, already a step ahead in terms of figuring out how employees can be productive and effective irrespective of where they work from. Interviews will be by um, uh, digital technology like Zoom, etc. Um, new hires will be onboarded virtually. Relationship building will go digital. We are already experiencing that for the Kellogg Foundation. The talent sourcing and acquisition strategies are, are already changing forever. Talent development strategies will need to be reviewed. So we are already looking at our learning curriculum and asking ourselves if we have a lot of disparate learning modules that we use to roll out for our employees, how do we bring it all together into one cohesive learning strategy that employees can relate to? In terms of um, facilities, we are um, definitely looking ahead at having, at watching the conditions one and then focusing on a staggered kind of return to work um, program so that we can start slow, be cautious, look at results and keep tweaking as we go. Um, and that include setting up office layout, um, protecting our front lobby, having protocols for visitors and for on-site meetings, setting up sanitizing, uh, sanitizing stations around the building, having touchless um, temperature scans, uh, knowing our HIPAA rules and how we will um, uh, protect PHI and how we will uh, maintain confidentially any records related to health screening of our employees. So there is a lot that we know we have to figure out when we are ready to open up our facility and that we are already trying to do for the essential workers that are in our building. And then looking ahead to business continuity, again, just thinking of efficiencies in terms of how we do the work, focusing on leadership development and continuity, and more than anything else, just remaining in touch with employees, learning to be, especially in the world that we live in today, learning to be understanding, flexible, uh, supportive, respectful, respectful um, to all and ensuring equity in all that we do. Uh, the next slide is um, really just a glimpse of, again, a related exercise that we went through to ask ourselves what our organizational strengths were. And we lifted up these core elements about us wanting to be a networked organization which was based on cross collaboration and, um, uh, and engaging for teams as well as employees that felt supported um, and, and that felt safe and that wanted and that we're being able to have a flexible and remote work experience which was supported by the organization. So again, um, the idea was just to go back to the basics, remind ourselves of Mr. Kellogg's um, uh, philosophy and core values, tying that to how we do work uh, internally and externally at the foundation and trying to build our strategies around that. And my final slide, I hope, will speak for itself in terms of um, uh, how we are, uh, what considerations we're keeping in mind as we go through the pandemic, but then as we uh, look ahead. So um, I know we are tight on time and I appreciate again the opportunity to be here and share and uh, looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for sharing uh, Kellogg's philosophies around equity and practices. That's going to be super helpful, I'm sure, for all of the attendees. Um, now we will transition to our third speaker. Last but not least, um, I'd like to welcome our last speaker, Chris Dilley. Chris has served as the general manager of People Food Co-op in Kalamazoo for 16 years, bringing People Food Co-op from 784 square feet of retail and sales of 390,000 to a new 6,800 square foot home and a recent peak of 3.6 million in sales. He has also helped People Food Co-op expand into farmers market management and e-commerce while staying centered on their mission of creating access for all to food that is healthy for people, land, and the economy. Chris has deep interest in social equity and has served for eight years on the board of eliminating racism slash claiming celebrating equity. 
please um, help me welcome Chris. Hi, everybody. Alexis, thank you so much for that. Good to, good to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about us and CFC and our experience uh, in supporting our team and community through the challenges of that COVID has been uh, very generous in providing. Um, so uh, that's just an intro slide. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, so PFC is a natural grocery in Delhi. We run a, a grocery store and farmer's market. If you go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about our store um, quickly. Um, so as Alexa said, we exist to create access for all to food that's healthy for people, land, and the economy. And um, we, another way that we're talking about ourselves is that we exist to nourish an equitable, resilient community. So over time, we've really uh, recognized and, and embraced the fact that we cannot provide access for everybody until equity is uh, really achieved and that that pathway is clear and a challenging thing. But resilience and equitability are crucial. Um, we are owned, uh, we are a consumer cooperative. We're owned by 3,525 individuals and families in our community and run a 7,000 square foot grocery store and um, currently employ 24 folks to do the work. Um, we're governed by a board of nine uh, representatives of our ownership and we structured in an equity lens to our uh, operations starting in 2013 with the launch of an anti-racism transformation team, which is putting front and center the uh, goals around equity and anti-oppression. Um, go ahead to the next slide. In 2013, we also started uh, operating Kalamazoo's Farmer's Market, which uh, currently supports over 200 vendors. Um, in a season uh, creates access for them to do the work that they do in order to uh, create access for the community. So um, we, on average, pre-COVID, would see 4,500 or so customers on a Saturday at this market and anticipate uh, about $1.6 million in sales by the vendor businesses at the market. Uh, so go ahead into the next slide. Key thing for us, uh, we are an essential business, uh, an essential organization. You know, the work that we do as creating access of being a grocery store and farmer's market are deemed essential. Um, and so we have stayed open throughout um, the entirety of COVID. And for us, that, uh, that really meant we had to be very rapid in identifying what was happening and being able to respond to that. Uh, so next slide. All types of information and data coming at us kind of regularly, quickly. Uh, this is just the, the graph, the latest graph as far as the uh, the COVID cases in Michigan, and we're monitoring that regularly. Um, you know the pressures and concerns that we have to be as 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 employers as well as uh, community entities need to be conscious of. Um, for, for us, we, uh, if you go to the next slide, realized that it was critical that we stayed on top of the latest information about uh, COVID, as well as what our staff was feeling and experiencing and uh, needing from us and from the community. And then, of course, being open to customers every day, um, needing to understand what the customer was looking for um, and foster a sense of safety and confidence to them as well. We had to be conscious of budget. Those are always pressures and concerns. Um, and then just the reality that change is happening rapidly. Change is always hard, no matter what. And then to be happening so quickly, uh, and so many questions about the the, the uh, nature of the disease and the nature of what our communities can be doing to best support them, uh, each other and and ourselves was was key to be aware. So. Um, if we move to the next slide, you can see that we spent a lot of time developing sort of uh, we have we had existing relationships with the National Cooperative Grocers Association, which is our sort of national entity that has some regional um, regional 
affiliations as well, and then the Michigan Farmers Market Association. So for us, those were critical resources. Um, in Kalamazoo, in Michigan, you know, we were um, a hot spot pretty quickly, but we were not as quick as California and New York. So we were, we were monitoring um, at the co-op, we were monitoring what the response was like so far at uh, co-ops in New York and in California and the West Coast and East Coast, learning from them, learning what they were doing, uh, being able to sort of anticipate what next phases might look like. Um, learning how staff and community were responding to different impacts um, of the disease and of decisions made by the organization. All of that was really super helpful for us. Um, Michigan Farmers Market Association provided similar leadership um, and does continue to provide similar leadership for the farmers market part of what we do. So I think finding those resources is really critical for us. And certainly paying attention to the CDC guidelines and how information was developing there, as well as the governor's um, executive orders providing clarity to um, expectations and uh, mandated action and so on have been also really critical uh, resources for us. Go ahead to the next slide. So for the store and the market, we created each a, uh, a pandemic plan, a written plan for each, um, and that was created in, in March uh, uh, for the store, and then in April as the farmer's market was gearing up for, uh, or trying to figure out what we were going to do as far as uh, opening. Um, in both cases, they were phased plans, and as Laura mentioned, um, phasing on conditions and on timeline, and so it's really impossible to determine timeline, but understanding conditions, understanding what sort of um, critical changes in the uh, conditions are happening and at what point we should be uh, implementing the next level of uh, change to our operation and staff support. Um, they were all, they also took into account supplies, things we, you know, maybe had on hand like gloves um, and sanitizer, needing to up those, uh, identifying who on the team was responsible for um, maintaining those supplies and so on, um, as well as adding in the supplies of masks as that became um, more important. Uh, communication, critical throughout this whole process for us and for uh, our our team as well as the community, just uh, the the plan needed to the plans needed to make sure they contained what kind of communication we were providing and how consistently. And um, the more robust we could be in our communication, the more it seemed like people responded and felt um, taken care of. I think in that. Um, and then identifying department level level needs and as the phases went through um, identifying the need for staff symptom reporting um, and other staff support. So the staff support side, um, we were able to secure a PPP loan um, and that helped us to provide some additional pay for our team. So there was a point at which um, the you could go on unemployment for more than we were paying um, given the, the sort of robust enhanced unemployment situation so uh, it was important to us to uh, to implement some kind of additional pay structure um, just to appreciate the team for being there every day I mean we were we are frontline workers in the sense of being in grocery being exposed to a lot of folks every day uh, and we wanted to make sure to support the, the team that with that extra way and we're uh, considering uh, additional pay overall based on the current conditions that continues to be a conversation. And then the EFMLA um, that was already talked about, um, that was an important part um, of, uh, you know, cl clarifying what PSC could do, was required to do, and, and then anything above what was required that we could do to support the team. Um, if they had a, um, a family member who was at risk or a family member who was showing symptoms, um, and our procedures are in those kinds of situations. And so we've had, uh, we, I'm grateful to say, and lucky, feel lucky that we have not had any um, team members 
uh, diagnosed with COVID or showing symptoms. We have had a couple of situations where they have been concerned that they were around somebody who had been exposed, and so we have a procedure for that um, that they're allowed to uh, apply for um, some leave, paid leaves as they wait for a test to come back. And, um, yeah, we did provide work from home options for the few employees that we could that were um, who were not required to be in the store to do their work. Um, and so that was helpful, I think. Um, when it comes to communication to the team in particular, we, we developed, um, we had a staff log already in place and we have a payroll um, scheduling structure online platform that folks uh, were already looking to. So we were able to use those platforms to get information out quickly. Again, we're small, so our team is relatively small. We tend to be um, in proximity frequently enough that we were able to also just do some direct touch bases. It's really important um, to me and to the management team that our team was being checked in with really regularly about how they were feeling about being in, in the space and um, what they needed in order to feel like they were getting the support you know, and that the, the co-op was providing them the support they needed to feel they were work. Um, and consistently we were getting reports that, and have been getting reports that it just feels like PSU's really conscious of what's happening and working really hard to ensure that the, the space is safe and uh, doing whatever we can with the virus. So there's only so much you can do, but doing whatever we can to, to ask, to listen, and then to act um, on what's needed and, and, uh, from both customer and staff perspective. Um, and those one-on-one -on -one touch bases, uh, you know, like, like in everything we do as, um, as folks who have staff and teams, like that stuff is, is so valuable, just as far as being able to, to get a gauge on where people are. Um, through this process, we had, we had previous to COVID had identified the need for an employee liaison as a small organization. We don't have um, specific HR support on, on, on this call because uh, because I am, in addition to being the general manager, one of my roles is to be the HR manager. And so um, uh, we have we definitely have consulting support as needed, but what we needed inside us out was an employee liaison of some sort. And so during this uh, early piece of COVID, we identified a staff member who was uh, eager to provide that kind of support and could be an additional sort of ear and um, you know, office to go to when you had when you had a concern. Um, and so keep the key piece about it. Um, so then, if we go on to the next slide, you can see a little bit of uh, what we were providing in the store. Um, as far as communication to customers, and I think maybe if you progress forward, it should stay on this slide, but add some, yeah, if you go ahead down the list, I didn't mean to uh, make this. Um, okay, so um, we, did, we began communicating. You can see we, uh, we say we require you to wear a mask for our safety. That began as we um, encourage you to wear a mask and then uh, and then progress to require as, as things became clear about the expectations is important to us. So all of these pieces are about um, providing some safety for our team as well as a, a sense of safety for our customers. Um, we began, uh, I, some, something I noticed throughout this process uh, of implementing quick change was how, it, how the team's creativity was um, was engaged um, in it. So we needed uh, with executive order number something uh, to have some way of limiting the number of folks in the store at a certain time. So one of our team members came up with the idea of like, let's have only 10 carts in the front and let's make sure everybody knows that they have to take a cart when they come in. Um, and then it became a team, you know, game in a sense to say, okay, does everybody in the store have carts? Okay, no, I, that person doesn't want to go grab a cart, but let them know what our expectation is. Um, and then setting the expectation around distance and, uh, and you know, we're a community-based organization, loves at the core of what we do. And so making sure that that six feet distance there uh, was shown with heart seemed important to us. We, um, 
expect customers and staff to wear masks in the store at all times, and um, and uh, we do provide gloves, masks uh, to both staff and customers as needed, um, and then uh, yeah, try to make up the rounds every once in a while, make sure everybody's in line with that. Yeah, go ahead to the next slide. These are uh, not awesome pictures. Sorry about that, but some of the some of the other expectations we put on customers to sort of help us stay safe in the space. We're at, uh, we're a sneeze guard at the register, sanitizing stations throughout the store, and then um, some clarity on the ground of uh, where six foot was in for different parts of the store. So um, as you're coming up to um, to the register on the right there. The sign that says we need you to stay back while we sanitize and then um, and then keep it. The next slide. We put signage throughout the store talking about clothes and um, and staying safe. Uh, so that's just an example of that. Next slide. And the last couple of slides are actually really more uh, more again about sort of engagement with our team. Um, you know, as things were rapidly changing, we went from being allowed to have a salad bar and hot food bar to no longer being allowed to do that. So our team was quickly coming up with ways of packaging things that we had previously not packaged to be able to keep providing access to the food that folks had come to expect from us. Um, and so this is an example, just an example, not a beautiful photos, obviously, but of, uh, you know, of our packaging. Um, versus uh, sort of a fresh open salad bar. So safe and also fresh and delicious. Um, to the next slide, we at the store um, went to an online, another innovation we did was went to an online for, uh, platform for sales. Uh, and at some point, we're probably between 15 and 20% of sales in the peak, in the early peak of COVID as we launched this in early April. Um, and then have uh, seen a resurgence of this. We've kept it online and continue to do the program. And as things have kind of heated up again, we're seeing this again. Um, we created positions to support this, um, and and it's been a it's been a great exercise. I think if, if the team feeling like okay, we're we're doing something to to positively support access in this community safely. That's been great. Um, finally, an example, another example of innovation was that our farmer's market, though it's open now to the public with uh, distancing guidelines, masks are now required as of this coming Saturday, uh, went from a recommendation to a requirement. Um, early on, we did not have uh, permission to use the city site, as a, which is a city-owned site, to have that. Um, happen on site as a regular traditional farmers market. So our team uh, innovated and using the support from the Michigan Farmers Market Association came up with a, um, a drive through market format. So this is some of the information we have around that. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's my last slide. And um, I think that I'm ready to hand it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information about cooperatives. That is very helpful. Um, I would like to now, uh, well, thank you to all the presenters. I'd like to now transition into our question and answer portion. Um, if, we, if I could ask all of the presenters to please come back to the screen, we will get started. Perfect. Nice to see all of your faces again. Um, so we have a lot of questions. You all shared a lot of really helpful information. Uh, to start off, I'd like to ask, um, so in light of COVID-19 and just the immense changes and transitions, how do you ensure equity in the workplace? And I pose this to any of you feel comfortable asking or answering, um, there's no particular order. I'm happy to start. Um, I okay. think Thank you. really, you know, I I have been doing um, and encouraging employers to do training on, you know, not just harassment and discrimination, but 
diversity and inclusion, inclusion being the key word, and um, civility in the workplace now for, for years. And I think it's more important now than ever. We have a landmark um, Supreme Court case decision. We've got um, so, so much going on in the world of equity um, in society right now, and so many fears about returning to work, what it's going to look like, how it's going to look, how are we going to be treated. That training is more important now than ever, and not just not just supervisors. And I said, absolutely, supervisors need to monitor for any inappropriate behavior in the workplace. But I think we really need to train our employees that we're all responsible for the culture in the workplace and doing bystander training is equally as important. And allowing opportunities for employees to voice their concerns, whether it be in resource groups or ally groups, or um, it's just creating an opportunity for them to talk about these things safely. Thank you. Yes, equity is very important um, and should be woven without. I agree. Would anyone else like to answer the question? I completely go ahead, Laura. I completely agree with what Anne Mary um, shared, uh, and uh, and we believe in all of that at the Kellogg Foundation. You know, half of our employees are people of color, uh, and several of them are based in some of the hotspot places: Detroit, New Orleans, um, uh, Jackson, Albuquerque. Um, uh, we have an office in Mexico City, so we are hearing from all of those places, not just our people in Battle Creek and. Um, and and we know that uh, it is communities of color that have faced a disparate impact uh, of the virus. Uh, and we've seen that within our own employees too, with several of our employees having lost several family members and friends. So it's uh, it has also been important for us to have that representation in the working group for COVID-19 so that we hear all those voices, we hear personally about what uh, 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 what's affecting employees' personal lives and that is going to guide and inform how we decide to come back. We also have what we call affinity groups. Uh, and marie thank you for uh, that segue. We also have our affinity groups uh, uh, and we have them with the, some other organizations may call them employee resource groups, but uh, we have those for um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, for the Black community, for Hispanics, um, uh, for the Indigenous Peoples group. So that has been another way for us to lift up employee voices and really um, ensure that uh, uh, we are aware and um, continuously learning, hearing those voices, and building in flexibility within our own strategies for return to work. And of course, the training, the training that Anne-Marie mentioned is also critical. Thank you, Laura. Yes, that is very important. Building community and camaraderie during this time is super helpful. Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So some of the things that PFC has done and is doing, uh, I mentioned that we, uh, starting in 2013, launched an anti-racism transformation team. Um, that team has been very active throughout this time and really since it was launched. Um, things that we have been doing prior to COVID are training around uh, understanding race, race and racial identity and how power plays out in in uh, based on identity in workplaces and so on, especially at PFC, um, we partnered with Erase, which is the organization that I've been serving on the board of, um, and uh, they partnered with a national organization, Crossroads Training and Organizing, uh, anti-racist tra training and organizing, um, to build that sense of understanding of how racism, especially structural and systemic racism, is at play and in individual sort of identity, how our identities and understanding our own identities sort of along the lines of the affinity groups that Laura, Laura is talking about uh, can inform that. So we have um, periodic caucuses, racial identity caucuses, so we can sort of deepen our understanding of how our identity is sort of showing up. Maybe, maybe we don't always understand that it's showing up a certain way and it's not helpful. Um, we 
have a work experience report form that explicitly calls out uh, if there are issues related to um, race or gender um, and so on that, that people have concerns about, they can put those in. Um, we regularly monitor pay equity based on race and gender um, at the organization, so that, that data is regularly going to the board. Um, through COVID and really through um, the murder of George Floyd and the, the sort of aftermath of that and continued concern or final, what feels like sort of finally ele elevated concern um, consistently, uh, we've been bolder in our communication about equity and how important that is to creating access for everybody and to being a community. Um, so we've been bolder in that with signage and so on. Um, and structurally, we've, we're going through another review of all of our policies and procedures and working in um, what have become habits around better um, support of these outcomes uh, now more fully into our policies and procedures. So those are some of the things. Awesome. That is very comprehensive and really important to understanding um, the foundation of equity and how these things work. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you for your responses, um, you all. I would like to now transition to fielding some questions from the audience. Um, and let's see if we can provide some more insight. Yeah, thanks, Alexis. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Sarah. I work with Michigan Nonprofit Association. I've been monitoring the chat box today with help from colleagues. Um, some really great questions asked there, and a lot of responses have already been given. We've been communicating with people um, via via text, but there's some good questions here that we want to pose because they're probably relevant to more people on the call. But also, um, we'd love to hear from all of the panel, you know, panelists that have um, contributions here because it's great to hear real-time examples or, or things that people have um, been dealing with in their um, organization. So first question, there's several questions around masks which may not surprise you um, with a lot of the conversation that's just happening in general these days. Um, some about if people are refusing to wear masks, if they have a political or um, religious reason not to wear a mask, maybe what some of the alternatives are, even just changing habits around masks and remembering to wear them when you're in um, public spaces. If any of the presenters have, um, you know, guidance or uh, want to share personal experiences around the whole mask issue, that would be wonderful. I can take the legal realm of the masks, and that is um, masks are required when they're required, and the only way around it is if you have a disability or you have a religious, a sincerely held religious belief that would prevent you from being able to wear a mask properly. For example, if there's some sort of religious garb that you're required to wear and the mask doesn't fit properly because of it or, or something with respect to that. With respect to disabilities, uh, I would again, um, we're seeing a little bit of fraud in that area, if you will, where people say, well, I have a disability, so I can't wear a mask. And they just presume that they're not going to be able, they're not going to have to wear a mask. Well, you know, you could ask for medical support for that accommodation um, and engage with the individual's doctor, sometimes just asking for the medical documentation backs down the objector if it is false. Um, but, uh, but otherwise just say, okay, well, here's a face shield. You can wear a face shield. Um, with a, if for some reason they can't wear a mask or a face shield and face coverings are, or some other form of face covering that the doctor says is acceptable, um, then you could either have them work remotely if they can perform the essential functions of their duties from home. And for example, I just dealt with an employer that had an employee who had a ton of administrative responsibilities. This was supposed to be the employee that was supposed to be taking temperatures and getting the surveys. And you, you can't do that if you're not in the workplace, right? So she couldn't perform the essential functions of her job remotely. And so in that case, if they can't, then another alternative would be a leave. Um, and whether or not it's paid or depends on 
if they could qualify for FSCRA or Michigan Paid Sick Leave Act, or if they have some sort of um, other paid leave available to them or not. With respect to a religious objection to wearing a mask, you know, it, it's really hard. Courts and the EEOC don't like you doubting the sincerity of their religious beliefs. So I would just next turn to the accommodation portion of the discussion, unless, you know, it's for some reason patently obvious that the religious belief is not sincerely held. And I would work with your outside counsel or inside counsel on that issue because it's really delicate and you want to make sure you deal with it properly. Um, there's no political excuse for not wearing a mask. Yes, our policy will also be to require masks. We'll be keeping a close eye on the state orders uh, in all of the places where our people are and being able to follow sometimes um, little differences between certain, uh, between a state order and then specific regions or city uh, related uh, guidelines. Uh, and, uh, and we'll be looking to our leaders in terms of understanding the language understanding the importance of HIPAA and PHI and um, and knowing when accommodation when to uh, you know hear and recognize a request for an accommodation and being able to uh, bring that uh, into the discussion with us in human resources so that we can um, we can respond appropriately. Chris, have you had to deal with customers who are refusing to wear masks and do, or who have accommodation requests? That's been pretty, yeah, definitely. That's the biggest um, area of concern for us. Our, our team adapted, it, adopted the mask re, um, request really quickly and uh, saw it as, a, as sort of a good faith way to say to the community, hey, look, we you know we're exposed a lot here, and so we want to limit exposure to you. This is our this is our commitment to you. Um, the customer piece: 98% of customers come into the co-op wearing masks, uh, and probably you think 85 to the market. Um, those are the harder conversations for sure, because there's a lot of perceptions that are that are kind of carried with um, the belief in a right to not wear a mask. Uh, so, so we we uh, we navigate those. We go direct as best we can. Uh, we have created an online portal for people to do orders for curbside pickup. That's really our go-to for that. It's like that's our accommodation for you as a customer. Is we we've made this commitment to you to be able to provide this access. Uh, we need your support, either masking up or or using that accommodation. Thanks everyone for your input there. Um, we have a really interesting question I think that just came in. Um, uh, someone who is representing a community public health clinic and um, is experiencing tension between their essential workers, like clinicians and medical assistants who have to be on site to do their jobs, and between them and the administrative staff who can perform um, their essential functions from home. Has anyone experienced that kind of difference in, in roles in the organization or have any suggestions on how to help um, resolve some of those um, tensions or feelings internally? At CFC, I mentioned that we, we had a couple of folks whose job did not require them to come in and um, we were they were comfortable, very comfortable staying home. Um, I think at some point it became uncomfortable to not be in the space with everybody else, sort of a sense of teamwork um, that was missing from that. Um, I wouldn't say that we ever felt the tension the way that I imagine that you're describing there. Um, so I, I, I was on the lookout for it because I was aware that that could easily become a major concern, but I didn't see it. I've seen it the opposite way where employees have been asked to come into the office, um, but employees have educated themselves about the executive orders. And in fact, there was just a newspaper article in the Detroit News this morning telling employees what their rights are right now, um, both a Q&A and a feature piece. 
And so they're being educated by outside sources as well. And so they're bringing in the executive order that says that if I can still work from home, I should be able to work from home. And so I think you could kind of flip it vice versa to the essential workers and say, hey, listen, you know, um, while uh, we understand that there's a loss of team, a loss of a sense of a team, right now we're having to comply with, with the executive orders and here's what it says and we're not trying to um, pick on you or, or treat you differently for, for any other reason that's not a lawful reason. We haven't had that uh, situation right now during the pandemic and of course for the most part we are working remotely, but I mentioned that a year or so ago we had uh, launched our flexible work program where um, uh, where uh, employees could choose to work from an alternate location and uh, and this concept had come up about um, equity and uh, equal opportunity and um, who would be able to uh, work remotely and who would be required to be in the office. And so we had done quite a bit of work around uh, having conversations with employees, ensuring that there was role clarity, uh, talking through considerations for the individual and for the organization, being clear about priorities, and just, again, wanting to give time and space for an open conversation with the employee and wanting them to understand the requirements of the job. So I think if we had to face the same situation, we would do something very similar, of course, in addition to state orders, requirements, et cetera. Thank you. Um, so thank you all. I'm going to turn it back over to Alexis. We're, we're right up against our end time here, but I appreciate your insight on, on some of these really important questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yes, yeah, so we are at the end of our session. Um, is there anything that you all would like to say to wrap up our session or anything that you would like to promote of your organizations that you feel would be helpful to our attendees? Stay in touch with your employees, engage with them. The more you talk to them and the more you hear from them, the better your own planning and your policies and your practices will be and um, and the more at rest you will feel about um, having done the best you could have done for your workplace and your workforce. Thank you. There's a lot out there. Stay on top. Try to stay on top of it. Um, I've got a COVID-19 resources page on the Clark Hill. Um, homepage um, where there's like you know recorded webinars and e-alerts and if you link in with me I try to um, keep keep people as posted as I can I, I can't imagine um, how difficult uh, being in your shoes and you know I have to deal with the legal considerations you have to deal with the people and legal considerations um, there's so much to keep up with and you know it just my heart goes out to all of you and I know you're doing your best. And um, if, if I can be of help in any way, I'm happy to do so. Awesome, thank you. Chris, anything to share? I agree with uh, what I'm hearing. I just really appreciate the chance to hear from Henry and Laura as well. I've learned a lot, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to all of you for sharing your knowledge, your information. Um, I'd also like to plug um, MCR. We have a lot of good information on our website as well, um, just staying on top and abreast of COVID-19 and all of the many changes. Um, at this time, I would like to turn it back to Kelly. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Again, thank you to Lara, Chris, Anne-Marie, and Alexis for presenting today and sharing your experiences and your knowledge. We appreciated the legal perspective balanced with the practical, both what do you do now and how should you be thinking about things in the future as it relates to this. Um, just encouraging, if you haven't checked out the chat function of the webinar so far, we've put a lot of the resources that have been mentioned throughout the presentation in there, including links. Um, and so I just want to make sure that those of you who haven't, that you have a chance um, to do that. 
Uh, we promoted the legal clinic, which again, we want to give a plug to that, um, that MCR hosts and um, anything that you might need or concerns that you might have that are specific to your organization's needs, it might be very um, worthwhile for you to sign up through that clinic and get some time with counsel to kind of walk through and talk through those specifics and ensure that you're not putting your organization or any of your people at risk. Um, and so I just want to make sure to, to note that. As was mentioned, those of us hosting the um, presentation and the webinar series have a variety of resources available on our websites. Um, we have also at Michigan Nonprofit Association been producing a COVID newsletter, as we know uh, our friends at the Council of Michigan Foundations have as well. MCR has been putting legal briefs out. I say all that not to overwhelm you, but to hopefully um, make sure that you know that we are resources to you, that we are trying to navigate this for you and put out things that kind of cut to the chase and maybe hopefully get you closer to answers and solutions um, that you're looking for. And as always, our friends at COVID at Detroit are um, putting out additional opportunities to connect um, and have additional training and opportunities as well. We'd like to thank everybody again for participating and ask that you help us to continue to serve you um, the best way we know how. When we close this session, you will be given a quick evaluation. This is vital for us on the planning committee to continue to provide opportunities like those that have been presented so far. Today's session, you help give us better understanding of what your needs are, not only for the webinar series that we continue to develop, but also to be able to just speak on your behalf and advocate for what are the needs of nonprofits, our foundations, and everybody in the sector as a whole. Um, speaking of for future sessions, please note our upcoming topics that we have and that we are looking at putting together all of the planning for and look for registration links through promotions of the series in the coming weeks. We've got a few things in the horizon, including leveraging technology and also working with nonprofit boards. Thank you again for the opportunity um, to present this information. Thank you to our presenters and we hope you all have a great day. Thank you.